we've completed the historical section of the Apocrypha, so we're entering into a new section that covered First Esdras and First and Second Maccabees. And so we're entering into the second and the largest section, which is the section of religious fiction that includes books like Tobit and Judith and the rest of Esther, the Song of the Three Holy Children, along with the prayer of Azariah in the midst of it, and the histories of Susanna and Bell and Dragon, which we've given you a list of those before. So we're going to start tonight with Tobit. How many of you have had an opportunity to read Tobit? Let me know how much we need to read. If you haven't had the opportunity, then we could take it this evening. Well, it seems like a good number of you have. It's a very interesting book. You probably got all wrapped up in it. Uh, <laughs> probably to a degree greater than First and Second Maccabees because it's so boring and historical and content. Well, I think you'll find that Tobit, if you haven't already discovered that on your own reading at home, is a very, very interesting book. It's a very interesting religious book of fiction, but it is interesting. It's what we might call the great adventure story of the Apocrypha because that it is indeed, and then some. Mm -hmm. So if you ever are bored at home, <laughs> you don't want to go out and buy one of those $1.95 paperback fiction novels at the store, you can just open up your Bible. Mm -hmm. That is your apocryphal Bible, and read the little 14 chapters of the little book of Tobit. It's very interesting. I like the book. I've read it before, and I enjoy reading the book because it is interesting more interesting than Leviticus in many regards <laughs> because it just keeps you going from chapter to chapter. You want to find out about those sparrow droppings and things like that and find out what's going on in this book. You can tell a lot of magical incantations are being worked and a lot of superstition threads its way throughout the book, which is the primary reason we're placing it in the category of being religious fiction, but it nonetheless is a part of the Apocrypha. And it's so much a part of the Apocrypha that just like we saw with 2nd Maccabees, remember more with 2nd than 1st, uh, the Roman Catholic Church uses it as the basis for a lot of its teaching, a lot of its doctrine. 2nd Maccabees that's particularly true of because it has so much that lends itself to popery. And so does this little book of Tobit. So if you haven't read it, we're going to be going through it this evening with the time that we have, and I think you'll find it very interesting. So let's start with a little background information of the book of Tobit. Well, I've already given you a characterization of the whole book. It's the great adventure story of the Apocrypha. Various books are known for their certain place that they occupy in the Apocrypha, and it would have to be the story of adventure and intrigue. Now, we're going to see it again in a book like The History of Susanna. But there you see... Uh, the great moral uprightness of the prophet Daniel, allegedly, uh, to a degree greater than in Tobit. Although the participants of the story are certainly religious and are certainly pious, I mean, that's going to end up being, as you will see later on, one of the major doctrines and therefore one of the major <coughs> faults in the book of Tobit, it's adventure <coughs> from beginning to end. I mean, in all good adventures, you have to have travel. You don't have travel in Susanna. You don't have travel in Bell and Dragon. But you do have travel here in the book of Tobit. It's all about taking this little trip to Ekbatana over in uh, the Medes and the Persians territory and what goes on before then, during then, and after then, which is how we'll divide the book up. So the story is about a man named Tobit, who's the son of a man named Tobiel. And Tobit has a son named Tobias. So they're all, they all three happen to have very similar names. Tobiel is the grandfather, Tobit is the father, the namesake of the book, and Tobias the son. And they are Naphtalites. They're from the tribe of Naphtali. Now, the name of the book is Tobit, but the chief character ends up being his son, Tobias. But Tobias couldn't be where he ends up, couldn't be the type of boy he was without a good father like Tobit, thus the name of the book, Tobit, rather than Tobias. So it's about a pious Nephthalite named Tobit. Uh, his wife's name is Anna. They have a son, Tobias. 
And through a long set of providential circumstances, Tobias is sent by his father, Tobit, to a city in Media to pick up 10 talents of silver. This is what the story is leading up to, and then you've got a lot of interesting details that help fill out this skeleton outline of the book. Pick up 10 talents of silver that his father had deposited whenever his father was an envoy for uh, King Shalmaneser of Assyria. And on the way, and of course every good adventure story has some love and romance in it, and this one certainly does. Eight husbands this one woman has, but she only ends up with one of them in the long run, and that's Tobias. So this story does have its love and its, its romance, because on the way of Tobias to the city and media to pick up these ten talents of silver, he stops off in a city and marries a distant relative of his named Sarah. Sarah, according to some people, is really uh, the heroine of the book. That's questionable. Uh, Tobit and Tobias are really the two leading characters. Sarah plays a minor role, but she's a pious individual as well. Of course, all the important people are piously religious. So Tobias brings his bride, as well as his money, uh, back home. He's able to cure his father of a curious form of blindness that he had obtained earlier. And all, all of this is done by the help of an angel. So an angel, a Raphael, is the chief angel, really the only angel throughout the book. And it's under his administration that all of these various secretive and sometimes supernatural events take place. The book was written around 200 B.C., which makes it one of the earliest of the apocryphal books although it purports to have been written much, much earlier, maybe somewhere in the neighborhood of 600 B.C., which tells us that he's trying to put something over on us right away. But the, the literal book of Tobit, as we have it today, and there are a lot of different recensions of it. There's Latin, there's Greek, there's Hebrew. Fragments of it were found in Qumran community, in the Dead Sea Scrolls. So there are a lot of fragments of Tobit left, a lot of different recensions of it, which shows the widespread popularity that it had uh, back then as well as throughout the history, not just of the Jews, but primarily of the church. But the literal book of Tobit was written around 200 B.C. And it's our best information, our best source of information, although it's not always totally reliable, for the day-to-day -day domestic life of the Jews during the intertestamental period. Now, if you've been paying attention in the class in intertestamental period, you'll see how providentially, by God's control, we're just setting all the right things at the right time. Amen. And you'll see how, and you see, I didn't plan this out, so I, we would have just covered all about the Assyrian kings and the Assyrian empire. Uh, you'll see how that it's just in time because we're going to go through here and see Shalmaneser and uh, Sennacherib and Esar Haddon. Remember all those Assyrian kings? They're all covered here by name. Uh, the book is built around these kings and their control of the northern kingdom of Israel and its fall in 722 B.C. Uh, so that just shows you another reason. You see, you couldn't really understand much about Tobit. You'd get in here to these Assyrian kings and you wouldn't even know who they are. And you wouldn't be able to catch some of the mistakes that we can catch in reading Tobit if you know something about these kings. So there's providence at work right here in our church. It's supposed to be at work here in the book. And it is if the story is true, but of course the story isn't, as we'll see going throughout it. But there's providence for you. It prepares all of us to know something about these Assyrian kings so we can know something about the book. As well as just the intertestamental period, because the book purports to have been written back around 600 B.C. You say, well, that's not intertestamental period. Well, that's true, but the book was literally written in 200 B.C. So this shows us what was the, the, the religious ideas of the people who lived, the Jewish people who lived in Palestine between the Testaments. And more than the religious ideas, we gather a lot of that from 2 Maccabees, by the way. It shows us the domestic, the day-to-day -day domestic affairs of the people. You have elderly people included, mothers, fathers, sons, distant relatives. You have the day-to-day -day experience, meals being eaten together, the marriage ceremony, wedding feast, marriage supper. You have all of these different concepts, some of which, of course, we see over in the New Testament. 
You see all of this very uh, picturesquely in the book of Tobit. Now, that's not why it's written, just to give us some day-to-day -day information of the intertestamental period. But if you sat down and wrote a book and it covered anything like this, even though you're not trying to let people know 2,000 years from now what's going on now, inevitably that enters into your story. Uh, just in passing, you'll mention different things about the way things are done in your home, around the home, in the family, which can be of a lot of importance to historians many centuries or even millennia, in this case with the book of Tobit, later who are looking back on your story. So that will become important. The author of the book, the true-to-life author, evidently was a Palestinian Jew. Since it's written between the Testaments, probably he's not down in Egypt, or probably he's not over really in Assyria, uh, like the book mentions. He knows a lot about Israel, and probably he lived in Israel. So with that said, then let's mention one more thing, the purpose of the book. The purpose of the book, and it's seen clearly in all 14 chapters. Now, I've summed it up in a long sentence, so maybe I better just quote it instead of trying to preach about it, and you can get down what you think is important. The purpose is to show that in the intricate workings of providence, although God may allow many grievous evils to befall the faithful, through it all, he has a purpose and a will and will ultimately bless the pious man with the reward that he's seeking. So it's a book about the providential control of God. It seems so many times that even the righteous ones, even the faithful, even right in the midst of their faithful uh, performance of duties to God, right in the midst of all that, they're smitten with some calamity. And yet if they'll faithfully go through the calamity, God's going to work something good out of that calamity, and he's going to be the one who receives praise in the final analysis. Now, all of that happens to be true, by the way. The whole purpose of the book is Romans 8, 28, to show that all things work together for good to those that love God, to those who are the called according to his purpose. But the details of the story are what are more than questionable. So I'll repeat it. To show that in the intricate, you'll see almost every chapter, we see intricate little details where Tobit is trying to do something good and then something evil results from that. And then in the evil, God blesses him again, and so he starts off good, and then something else evil comes from that. Yet the whole time, God is trying to work his will out in the life of Tobit, as well as his relatives and future descendants. So to show in the intricate workings of providence that although God may allow many grievous evils to befall the faithful, which it certainly does Tobit, he has his share of trouble and grievous evils in the book, evil events and so forth. Through it all, God has a purpose, and ultimately, he'll bless the pious man with whatever the reward is that he's seeking. Now, that's the purpose of the book. And we'll say something else about the purpose later on. We're seeing, certainly, the outworkings of the providence of God. But yet, concerning this faithful man and what he does, there's even a deeper religious meaning hidden there, which we'll look at whenever we get to it. Okay, the book is composed of 14 chapters that I've divided up into three units. Obviously, if it's got 14 chapters, we could divide it up into 14 units, but that even makes it more difficult to remember. So chapters 1 to 5, it's all built around this trip that Tobias takes to Ekbatana. So that's the way we're going to divide it. Chapters 1 to 5 are pre-journey events that take place in Tobit's family. This makes the book a little easier to study and to remember pre-journey, that is, events that take place in the family and life of Tobit prior to the journey that Tobias takes, starting in chapter 6. So that would be the first five chapters. Then the next five chapters give us the journey itself that Tobias is taking to uh, the country of Media, but on the way there, the angel gets his attention and they stop off in Ekbatana. 
which will give you the spelling of that if you don't already know it, and look at a place where it appears right in your Bible. And then finally, chapters 11 through 14, post-journey events. Tobias comes back home. If you remember the account in the book, his mother has gone out day after day after day looking down the road for his son, and she and her husband have just about given up hope, Anna and Tobit, that Tobias is ever going to come back. They're worried about that individual with whom they uh, trusted the care, to whom they trusted the care of Tobias, namely uh, Raphael the angel, whom they didn't know was an angel because of some things that he tells to them. And so he comes back finally there in chapter 11, and we have all of the post-journey events. It's so fascinating that the best way to cover the book is just to go step by step by step. So let's start then in chapter 1. Hopefully you've got your Bible along with you, and we'll start in chapter 1. Chapter 1, verses 1 to 2, give us the prologue. Introduces, this is the story of Tobit. From the end of the first verse, that he's from the tribe of Naphtali. So he's from the northern kingdom. He's from Galilee, what we refer to now as Galilee, or in the New Testament is referred to as Galilee, Upper Galilee, the tribe of Naphtali. The first two verses, the prologue, chapter 1. We also find out in the second verse that he was alive whenever Israel fell with her capital, Samaria, in 722 B.C., which helps to start dating things right away. He was taken captive in the time of Shalmaneser, king of Assyria. So that puts us somewhere toward the end of the 8th century B.C. And like I say, that's a big help because one thing that's going to become important in our questions and challenges about the book are things that relate to chronology. Then in verses 3 through 8, here we have a history of the division of the kingdom at Solomon's death. By the way, if you've got your, what, kings and prophets chart, we're going to be needing that sooner or later. You might want to go ahead and get it out. Your kings and your prophets chart. The division of the kingdom. Verses 3 through 8. So you remember what takes place. You can see it's at the very top of your Old Testament kings and prophets chart, around 930, 931, with Rehoboam and Jeroboam the first. Remember, there were two Jeroboams in the Old Testament. The Jeroboam the second was the great one of the great kings. Although he wasn't a good king, I'm speaking financially and materialistically speaking. He was a parallel almost to David and Solomon themselves because of the extent of the kingdom under Jeroboam II. But anyway, that doesn't concern us. That's Old Testament history and introduction. All we need to be concerned about is Jeroboam I because he's the one living around this time, verses 8 through 11. And so you know how the story goes in the Old Testament uh, that the king in Israel sets up uh, the golden calves, the golden idols, and most of the people in Israel follow after them sets up one, for instance, in Dan, as we read in the Old Testament, and only a few, only a very few pious, faithful Israelites from the northern kingdom take it upon themselves to journey down to the true temple and to the true place of God's abode and the people's worship, which is Jerusalem in Judah, and of course, being who he is, a righteous, pious Israelite, Tobit is one of these. For instance, if you look in um, uh, the end of the end of verse 4. It was there that God's dwelling place, the temple, had been consecrated, built to last for all generations. Now remember, remember when this book was written, by the way. It was written in 200 B.C. And yet, the author is making us think, this individual is making us think that he's living around the time of the division of the kingdom. So you've got to forget about 200 B.C. and think that his concept then, assuming that he lived during Solomon's time, was that the temple had been built to last for all generations. It would never be destroyed. And yet we know that really he's living after. The true author is living after it's been destroyed. And yet this is still his hope. This is still what he's looking forward to, is the temple, now we're talking about a post-exilic one, which didn't even begin to compare in magnitude to the Solomonic temple, but it's going to last forever. 
He says in verse 5, All my kinsmen, the whole house of Naphtali, my ancestor, sacrificed on the mountains of Galilee to the calf which Jeroboam, king of Israel, had made in Dan. Well, you see, you don't have to look in your Bible. I was telling you that's in the Old Testament. Well, it's found right here. At the festivals, I was the only one. Remember the three yearly holy pilgrimages that the male Jews were required to make back to Jerusalem? That's the festivals he has reference to. He said, I was the only one to make this frequent journey back to Jerusalem. So that shows that he is a pious, piously minded one. And then from verse 6 down through verse 8, he gives a teaching about how he's gone to carry the threefold tithe. Now, do you remember the teaching that we just did? You see how all this ties together mm -hmm. about tithing, how I said that really it was more like a triple tithe. It was more like 30% of someone's income. Look here. This is the teaching. And he's not trying to teach on tithing or anything. You see, these things just come out. Uh, you, if it's true, it can't help but just slip out, even while you're trying to write about something that's false. And so here we have a three-tenths of one's income being given. Uh, you look in, well, the verses are so long here, but verse 6 mentions the first tithe. Look in the middle of verse 7, the second tithe. Look in uh, the first part of verse 8, between the first and the middle. Uh, every third year, this is the third tithe that he takes. So how do you like that? Right in the Apocrypha. We find a true account, according to the book of Leviticus, that there was a threefold tithe, which means triple of your 10%, not just one tithe, triple that amount that had to be given. So if you remember the teaching about tithing that we did not long ago, here's another proof of that. And you see, he's not trying to teach us on tithing, so he's not trying to deceive us about tithing or anything like that. He's just trying to tell us about how righteous and pious this individual was and that he lived in accordance with Old Testament law. Even though he was a part of the apostate northern section of Israel, he still was trying to live the right type of life. So that's verses 3 through 8. But I just mentioned that in passing because it's another thing that we just recently studied. See, if we wouldn't have studied that, then I'd be trying to explain all that to you about tithes and the church's doctrine of tithing and what our position is. But see, now you already know that. So now you just run through there and you see, well, there's the triple tithe. So next time someone says about tithing, say, all right, tithe the Old Testament way then. That means at least 30% of your income. People are pronouncing, thus saith the Lord, this is the year of the tithe. Foolish charismatics are prophesying things like that. Now, always talking about tithing. Be sure to give your tithes and your offerings. Someone gave me a tape to listen to the other day, and you hear it on just about every charismatic tape. They weren't teaching on it, but in passing, here comes tithes and offering, tithes and offering, tithes and offering. Well, tithes, okay, we're going to let you tithe. <laughs> Make sure it's triple, though, whatever you're giving. Make sure you triple it, and that's fine with us, fine with the Lord, fine with Moses. You'll be a good little Jew at heart because you're giving three-tenths of your income. Woe be unto you if you gave 31%, though. Next year, you'd have to give 29 to make sure everything balanced out. <laughs> well, you know how that goes, the old deceitful heart of man. He's going to try to rob God of everything possible. And the tithing is just one method of robbing God. You bind yourself by something that you know you can get by with and not miss it. Well, there's a tape on that. Verses 9 through 22 gives us the history of the Assyrian captivity, 722 or 721 B.C. Different scholars pick different dates. We generally say it was 22 because it's easy to remember than 21. He talks about in verse 9, he talks about his marriage and his son that he has. We see Shalmaneser, uh, verse 13. Now, he doesn't mention Tiglath-Pileser the third. He starts with uh, the second of the four or five important kings of Assyria that we've dealt with before, and that's Shalmaneser. So Shalmaneser, and now you already know something about that. We'll come back to him and to this passage later on. Uh, then verse 15, Shalmaneser dies, and he's succeeded by his son Sennacherib. So we know Sennacherib from 2 Kings and uh, from the book of Isaiah. He's the one in 701 B.C. who even tried to take Judah. Israel had already fallen. He comes and tries to take Judah. As a matter of fact, uh, look down in verse 18. See if this sounds familiar to you. 
Uh, Tobit is the speaker. He said, I buried all those who fell victim to Sennacherib after his flight from Judea when the king of heaven executed judgment on him for all his blasphemy. What does that sound like? Well, Isaiah, the book of Isaiah. When Sennacherib went and blasphemed the Lord, God said, I'll put a hook in his nose and I'll drag him back to his land and there he'll die. And how did Sennacherib die, by the way? By his two sons, all right? Look down in verse, uh, into verse 20. Or verse 21, it should be. However, less than 40 days afterwards, the king was murdered by his two sons. Well, you see, you know that's right in your Bible. So that's right. There's a historical truth that's right. And look at the net. Where did they go? The two sons. Okay, we studied that way back in creation. They go up to Ararat or Armenia, as you see in your Bible. They took refuge in the mountains of Ararat, and his son, who is his son, Esau Haddon. Well, that's right in your Bible as well. You can find all of this over in the end of uh, the 37th chapter of Isaiah, like around verses 37 and 38. His son, Esau Haddon, succeeded him. And so I think here in the last couple of verses, um, he has been put out of Nineveh, Tobit, and then he has a nephew, I believe, a Hikar, his nephew, is uh, lifted up to a position of administration in the kingdom under Esau had, and so Tobit's allowed to come back with his family, come back to Nineveh. Okay, chapter 2. Some of it we'll read, some of it we can just pass over and sum it up, and you can get uh, whatever you can down. Chapter 2, verses 1 to 8. This is really uh, the initiation of the story because something happens here that causes something else to happen, that causes something else to happen. This is the way providence works. And then it just goes on and on and on throughout the story. So what do we have happen? Well, we've got the Feast of Pentecost, or the Feast of Weeks, verses 1 to 8. And Tobit has sat down at his meal. They're going to have a big feast now because it's this religious Jewish religious festival. When he sits down, the first thing that comes to his mind is, I wonder if there's any poor, destitute Israelites out there. Now, if you don't already know this, and I might not have mentioned it uh, strongly enough to, for you to remember, all this is taking place in Nineveh. That's the background for the story. The whole story is taking place in the city of Nineveh, which we also just talked about not long ago. So you know some things about Nineveh and Asher and the Great Zab River and Euphrates, Tigris, and so forth. And by the way, Tigris is going to be important. They go fishing in the Tigris River here. So all of it, you see, comes uh, right out of our teachings in intertestamental period for the last few times. It's all covered here in the book. So he sits down and he thinks, well, maybe there's a destitute Israelite out there. And so before they even eat, he sends Tobias, Tobias out, see if he can find someone. And Tobias, before he can find someone who needs food, he finds someone that's too late for them to eat because someone strangled them to death, a Jew in Nineveh, uh, that was murdered uh, at the end of verse 3. And so rather than eat, Tobias Tobit jumps up and runs out to bury the individual because, you see, you have to bury the Jew. That was something that the Jews did. You couldn't just leave the corpse out in the open. You had to bury it. So he jumps up and goes out to bury the man. And of course, since he had to touch a dead body, that meant that he became unclean. This shows his pious nature because he was willing to forego this great feast of Pentecost just so he could make sure that he buried this dead Israelite. Because now that he's come into contact with a dead man, <clears throat> he's no longer clean himself, so he can't eat. He doesn't even come into his house. He doesn't want to defile his home. So he just sleeps outside. And it's his sleeping outside that causes his problem. Verse uh, 9 and verse 10, which we'll come back to later on, we have his little episode with the sparrows, <coughs> which ends up blinding him, and he ends up blind throughout the rest of the book until he's miraculously cured uh, by some innards of a fish that was caught out of the Tigris River later on in the book. So that's verses 1 to 8. Then verse 9 through verse 14, well, I've really already started into that. We have problems that result from this episode of him jumping up from the table and going to bury this dead Israelite. We've got problems that result. The first problem was the Pharaoh dropping. I just told you about that. 
verses 9 and 10. Then verses 11 to 14, we have another problem. If you're blind and you're the breadwinner of the family, now you can't work. So he's blind for four years. And for the first two of those four years, he is supported by his nephew, a high car, who had been promoted to an administration position under Esau Haddon. But then a high car has to move from Nineveh two years after Tobit had become blind, which means that he's going <coughs> to be dependent on his wife, Anna, who is a dressmaker. And so, like generally happens whenever the wife is the breadwinner of the family, you're going to have a family argument over finances. That's exactly what happened. That's a portrayal of American culture today. You know, there are many people like doctors, lawyers, who go to school years and years, and while they're there, their wife is back somewhere working. And so, like generally happens whenever the wife is the breadwinner of the family, you're going to have a family argument over finances. That's exactly what happened. That's a portrayal of American culture today. Amen. You know, there are many people like doctors, lawyers, who go to school years and years, and while they're there, their wife is back somewhere working. And, of course, it's a temptation with your wife. You're putting all this money into your husband's education. You'd like to spend some of that yourself. And so sooner or later, arguments erupt over whose money that really is. So sure enough, they have a little problem over Anna and her working situation. Here's what happened. She's been a good worker. There's nothing wrong with Anna. Uh, really, this is the only flaw in Tobit, and it's meant to point out a good characteristic in him. But what happens is, after she's done her day's work, her employer not only pays her her wages, but gives her a kid, uh, a, a goat from the flock. And she brings it home, and Tobit, of course, just can't believe someone would actually give her that, so he accuses her of being a thief. So they go back and forth arguing. She said, no, they gave it to me. And he said, no, you stole it from them. And finally, she criticizes him the very last uh, sentence, so much for all your good works and acts of charity. Uh, now we can see what you are. Because, you see, it's his good works. Remember jumping up from the table that got him in the position of sleeping outside, that put him underneath the sparrows, that brought the droppings in his eyes, that made him blind, that made him lose his job, that made him dependent upon Anna, his wife, the dressmaker. You see, one thing after another, after another, after another, builds upon itself. That's why it's a beautiful story. Very, very, very well written, for sure. That's why you stay so intrigued, and you see a plot throughout the whole. And there's a plot. He's trying to reach some goal here. And it's fairly easy to see where he's headed. Okay, chapter 3. We're still in the first section, the pre-journey events. We haven't gotten to the journey. If you haven't read the book yet, you probably don't even know what we're talking about when we talk about the journey. But that's what the book surrounds itself with, this journey. Chapter 3, the first six verses which really almost should be connected with chapter 2, we have the prayer of Tobit for God to take his life. Oh, he's in a miserable state now. All of his acts of charity have gotten him nothing. You see, remember we talked about the purpose being the providential control of God, that although something evil happens, something good's going to come out of that, and when something good happens, you're going to end up doing something wrong again, and something good will come from that. Well, the first six verses, after he's had this argument with his wife, in the last four verses of the preceding chapter, now he offers up this prayer that God would just take his life so he won't be a burden to anyone else ever again. So we're not going to go through that. Then starting with verse 7 down through verse 15, lo and behold, at the same time, in other words, as they say in the story, the caption of the story, meanwhile, meanwhile back at the ranch, well, meanwhile, <laughs> meanwhile, way over in Ekbatana, a distant relative of his, uh, Raguel, has a daughter whose name is Sarah, who also has been a good girl, very virtuous, chaste young woman, who's done nothing wrong but everything right, yet everything wrong and nothing right has happened in her life. She's married seven different husbands, and all seven of them have been murdered on the wedding night. <laughs> And so verses 7 to 15 give us her prayer. You see, the first six verses 
give us Tobit's prayer. And so you know both of them are praying, and so somehow they're going to get together over this whole thing. Now, I don't think that they're going to divorce or whatever and remarry. That's not going to happen here. Something better than that's going to happen. The story is a lot better than that. Uh, so verses 7 to 15, uh, Sarah, now after she's had her seventh husband murdered on their wedding night, she has considered just taking her own life. She was going to hang herself. But then she thought again, well, that would disgrace my father if I hung myself. So she just asked God to somehow take her life. She doesn't really specify how, but she's willing to just go ahead and die as well. So the two prayers go together because both of them have done nothing wrong and everything right, and yet nothing right but everything wrong is happening to them. And as a result, they're wanting to die, not just to escape the world, but so that they won't be a burden to anyone else. Tobit, to his dressmaking wife Anna, and Sarah, to her eighth husband, who, if she ever married, he'd probably die like the other seven had. So they prayed these eloquent prayers. So the last two verses, 16 and 17, just like in the book of Daniel, God hears the prayers and sends his angel. But lo and behold, it's an unbiblical angel, Raphael, the angel. Good Spanish angel is sent to him. Verses 16 and 17 sent to both of them to help both of them out in their problem. The very time the prayers of both of them were heard in the glorious presence of God. Verse 17, his angel Raphael was sent to cure them both of their troubles. Tobit, by removing these white patches from his eyes so that he could see God's light again. And Sarah, daughter of Raguel, who remember, by the way, was Moses' father-in-law. Not this same man, but just the name or Jethro, or Ruel, three names in the Old Testament, by giving her in marriage to Tobias, son of Tobit, and by setting her free from this wicked demon, Asmodeus. For it was the destiny of Tobias, and by the way, there's the teaching of predestination. It occurs at least twice, and there's the first of the two. Tobias, and not of any other suitor to possess her. At the moment when Tobit went back from the courtyard into his house, Sarah, daughter of Ruel, came down from the attic. How do you like that? Everything timed just perfect. Tobit finishes his prayer and goes back in his house, and Sarah finishes her prayer and comes down from the attic. And they're miles and miles apart from one another. <laughs> well, I told you, it's a good novel. Hopefully, if you haven't read it, we'll spark your curiosity so that you will. I told you last time, after we got beyond those historical books of Maccabees, we'd get into some more interesting things. And we've got some others that are just as interesting as this, although maybe not quite as adventurous as this one. So, in other words, enjoy it while you can and while we're here. Chapter 4. Again, we've got something good coming out of something evil. Remember, Tobit has lost his eyesight, therefore lost his job, therefore lost the argument with his dressmaking wife, Anna. And so he doesn't have any money, and he wants to be able to be the supporter of the family. So lo and behold, it comes into his memory after 20 years' absence that he had left ten talents of silver with a friend of his one time when he was visiting his city uh, under Shalmaneser in Media. And so what chapter 4 is about, all of chapter 4, is about Tobit remembering this and then making plans with his son Tobias to go and get this silver. If you've got a Bible like mine, you've got maybe a lot of the verses stuck down at the bottom between 6 and 19. And really, they should all go up in the text. We're going to end up using at least one of them. But different manuscripts, of course, have different verses, and other ones don't. But if you've got a Bible like mine, or an Apocrypha like mine, then you see a, a skipping from verse 6 to verse 19. And so you can find all of that down at the bottom of the page. And we're going to end up using one of those verses, so remember that it's down there. Otherwise, you've got a real, real short chapter. You start off with verse 1, and when you look to the end of the chapter, you're already to verse 21. And yet it doesn't look like you can count 21 verses there. Well, maybe none of you were quick enough to spot that. But you can spot all of it down at the bottom of the page. So that's what all of that chapter is about about remembering about this silver that, uh, well, I need to give you the reference. That's back in chapter 1 and verse 14. That's just, you see, mentioned in chapter 1 and verse 14, incidentally. But yet it's going to become very important, them going and getting the silver so that he can provide for his family so that he doesn't argue with his wife anymore. 
So it's just mentioned in passing there, and it's going to be developed more later on. Then chapter 5, which is the last chapter of this first section. Chapter 5, we have preparations for the trip to Media. Preparations of Tobias for the trip. The first three verses, we have two problems brought up by Tobias to his father Tobit about going to get this money. Found in the first three verses, and the first of the problems is also solved in the first three verses. And the first problem is, how can I prove that I'm who I say I am to this individual, and how can I prove that that money really belongs to you? He said, it's been 20 years since you left it there, so how can I prove that I'm the one that should take the money from this friend of yours that you left it with? And the solution to that, found in the first three verses, is that uh, Tobit gives him a seal, you know, like a, a receipt that he's had this whole time that will guarantee to his friend that Tobias is the one who uh, legally should be allowed to take the money. Then the second problem that's brought up, and the second problem is solved in verses 4 through 22. The rest of the chapter is about the second problem, is I don't know the way to media. I don't know which road to take. I don't know how to get there. And remember, all of this is taking place in Nineveh. Don't think of them living back in Israel or something like that. They're all living in Nineveh. But yet you still got to go. Remember where Nineveh is. See, since you know where that is and you know where media is, uh, southeast of Nineveh, you've got a long way to go, several hundred miles to get down to Media. Of course, you could just jump on in a boat, get your motorboat, and jump in the Tigris and take off down the Tigris. That'd be the fastest way to get there. But they didn't have motorboats back then. <laughs> Cruise, sailboats, they didn't have that. They just got out and walked whenever they went somewhere. And people complain about driving 10 miles to church. <laughs> <laughs> What comes to mind? You know, you go down in South America or even Mexico and preach the gospel, and people will walk for miles and miles and miles just to hear. And now people live next door, and it snows a little bit, or it's too hot outside, and the air conditioner doesn't work in the car. Well, I think we'll skip this service then. Oh, God forbid that any of us ever be like that. Uh, if we ever are, he'll probably move all of us to the equator one day, where you'd be glad if it was 130 inside instead of 150 outside whenever we were doing our studies or something. Yeah, you know, I have to think about that every night. Every time you're tempted to be too cold or too hot, we could always be at the North Pole or the South Pole or halfway in between, which would be miserable in two extremes to be either place. Amen. We're doing pretty good where we are right now. It was cold out there today. When I got up this morning, it was below zero, and the wind was just blowing fiercely. It must have been 40 or 50 below outside. But it's a lot worse than that. It's perpetually dark at the North and South Pole, so I don't think we'd want to be there. Well, anyway, the only way he can get there is to walk. And so the problem is solved. He sends out uh, Tobias to find a man, verse 4. He says, go out and find a man who knows the way. And so he goes out and finds Raphael who comes to his assistant, tells him that uh, he knows how to get there, and so uh, he brings uh, Raphael before his father Tobit. His father checks him over, says, okay, I think he'll do. So he sends off his boy and uh, his guide. Verse 17, then his mother, just like most typical moms, burst into tears and sent my boy away from home. Is he not our prop in our stay has he not always been at home with us sounds like the typical american boy too why send uh money after money <laughs> <laughs> write it off for the sake of the boy let us be content to live the life the lord's appointed for us so forth tobit said don't worry he'll come back safely and finally he won that argument the last sentence at that time she stopped crying so there's all of the pre-journey events then we said chapters 6 through 10. Chapters 6 through 10 give us the journey itself. So in chapter 6, we have the trip. The whole trip is taken from start to finish in chapter 6. 
in verses 1 through 8. There are two important things about chapter 6. Verses 1 to 8, we have the fish episode at the Tigris River. Verses 1 to 8. Uh, then verses 9 through 17, we have a dialogue between Raphael and Tobias with the former trying to convince the latter that he ought to marry Sarah whenever he gets to Ecbatana. Well, they arrive there in verse 9. They're coming near the city, anyway, on their way to Media. And, of course, Tobias said he didn't really want to because he heard what happened to her seven other husbands, <laughs> which he's a smart boy. And yet the angel brings some other uh, arguments in his favor and finally convinces the boy that'd be the good thing to do, to marry Sarah and that everything will happen well and they'll live happily ever after. Which in verse, well, right in the middle of that long 17th verse gives us the second reference to predestination. She was destined for you before the world was made. So the angel convinces him with the argument of predestination. I don't know if I want to get into verses 1 to 8 yet. We'll come back to it whenever we study something else about the book. But starting there with the uh, second verse, Tobias has gone down to bathe in the river. And this huge, evidently prehistoric fish jumps out of the water, tries to grab his foot and swallow him. And the angel says, grab him! And so he grabs the fish and cuts out his intestines, you know, the inner parts of the fish, and he's going to put them in a little bag and save them for some magical purposes later on. <laughs> Cooks and eats part of the fish and salts and keeps the rest of it. Into verse 5. So he's carrying around a dead fish's gall and uh, his heart and so forth, which is going to become very important later on. So we'll move beyond that and we'll come back to it if you don't know what I'm talking about. Chapter 7. Chapter 7. They have arrived at Ekbatana. Uh, before we go on, let's just take a look at Ekbatana in the Bible. If you go over to the book of uh, Ezra, it's one of the cities in the Medo-Persian region. Ezra chapter 6. I don't know how much you remember. I always remember more than you because there's impossible for my mind to ever wander up here. Or it's not impossible, I just have to make sure that it is impossible for my mind to ever wander. We'd all be lost, that's for sure. So I always remember what I say. I can remember years ago. Sometimes people ask, well, I think that you said this. I don't ever say that I know I didn't because I don't want them to prove that I didn't know what I was talking about. But the odds are I probably remember, at least in the last few years, whether I said it or not. But I do remember changing this word a long, long time ago. I don't even know where it was. Probably Old Testament introduction. But Ezra 6, we pointed this out, Ezra 6 and verse 2, Darius the king made a decree, search was made in the house of the archives, which we changed a long time ago, where the treasures were laid up in Babylon, and there was found at Akmetha, look in your margin, Ekbatana, and that's what the Hebrew says, that's the official name of the city, Ekbatana, not Akmetha. Akmetha was just another name for it, but its true official name and the name in the Hebrew is Ekbatana. It's an important, famous city. It's one of the important cities here of the book. So there's just one place where it appears in your Bible. The only place, by the way, that I remember of. So they have arrived at Ekbatana. The angel has convinced Tobias that Sarah's the woman for him, regardless of what's happened to her seven previous husbands. So in verses 1 to 8, Raphael and Tobias arrive at the house of Reguel. Verses 1 to 8, they arrive at the house of Raguel, which is the father of Sarah. And they come in, wash themselves and so forth, sit down to the dinner table. And then verses 9 through 18, verses 9 through 18, we have preparations for the marriage. Preparations for the marriage. Tobias, remember, has already been convinced. Uh, by the way, Obergoel is such a doubter that after the marriage has taken place, while um, they're in their bedroom, he's out digging a grave. <laughs> <laughs> the mother, uh, Edna is the mother. Edna, 
<laughs> Edna's a little more positive than Raguel. Raguel takes the servants out and says, let's go dig a grave. We're going to have to bury the boy whenever morning comes around. Of course, he has a surprise for him. Tobias can't die. The story would be over if Tobias would die. He's an important character here. Table verses 9 to 18, and Raguel tries his best to talk Tobias out of marrying his daughter because he doesn't want to happen to him what's ha happened to all the others thus far. But he's not successful because the arguments of Raphael uh, come over and against the arguments of Raguel. Okay, then in chapter 8, chapter 8, verses 1 to 9, we see that the bridal night goes off without a hitch, contrary to what doubters like Raguel are thinking, because this evil demon, which has caused the death of her seven previous husbands, is driven away by a magical charm. Then verses 10 to 21, we have the post-marriage celebration. Verses 10 to 21, we have the post-marriage celebration. Well, you can see there in verse 10, Raguel got up and summoned his servants, and they went out and dug a grave. For he said, he may have been killed, and then we shall have to face scorn and disgrace. When they had finished digging the grave, Raguel went into the house and called his wife, and then wanted to find out whether he was still alive. Then look down in verse 18. Once he found out he was still alive, then he ordered his servants to go and fill that grave back in before daylight came. <laughs> See, all that was done at night, so no one would know what's going on there. They dug it at night, and he slipped back out and had the grave filled back in by his servants before dawn the next morning. I doubt any of us have participated in a marriage or wedding ceremony like that. <laughs> That's what you call an unforgettable ceremony. <laughs> If you don't know what I'm talking about, we'll deal with it more later on. <laughs> Chapter 9. <laughs> Chapter 9. Now, Chapter 9 really isn't that important. It has to be stuck back in. Oh, by the way, in the end of Chapter 8, uh, the father of Raguel gives half of all of his goods, half of his inheritance, to his new son-in-law, Tobias, which, you see, by the way, solves the economic problems of Tobit and his dressmaking wife, Anna. They see, something good always follows something evil. But since the whole purpose for them taking this trip, according to Tobit and his plans without knowing the providence and workings of God, was to go and get these ten talents of silver. So the story can't end without them getting the ten talents of silver. So all of chapter 9 is about Tobias sending Raphael to go ahead of him and get those ten talents of silver. That's what all of chapter 9 is about. And then Raphael as well as Gabael, that's the friend of Tobit who had the money, uh, actually make it back to the ceremony in time and come back in right in the midst of the feast, verse 6, and they're all rejoicing. So that little short chapter 9 really kind of finishes out the tale about the ten talents of silver. Okay, chapter 10. Chapter 10, verses 1 to 7. Here's this pitiful picture that's been painted of Tobit and Anna, sad, 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 over what they think is the loss of their son because he's delayed in his return so long. Now, day by day, Tobit was keeping count of, of the time that Tobias would take his journey when he'd be back. When all those days had already gone by and his son hadn't returned, Tobit said, well, perhaps he's been detained there, or perhaps Gabael is dead and there's no one to give him the money. And so he grew anxious. And Anna, his wife, said, My child has perished. He's no longer in the land of the living. She began to weep and lament for her son. Oh, my child, the light of mine eyes, why did I let you go? Verse 7, Each day she would rush out and look down the road her son had taken and would listen to no one. When she'd come indoors at sunset, she would never sleep, but wept and lamented the whole night long. Well, I find that impossible to go two weeks without any sleep at all. And that's about how long it had to be because he's gone. You see uh, the next paragraph, two weeks, the two weeks of the wedding celebration. And that doesn't count the trip there and the trip home. So she went without sleep for about a month and just cried the whole night. That was some type of drug she was on. <laughs> Better than the ones out there in America today. Go to Purse if you want to find your drugs. They'll keep you away <laughs> for a whole month. I don't know what type of weed they grow over there, but it was a potent one, that's for sure. 
Well, I don't know how she... He doesn't explain how she stays awake so long. It's one of those inconsistencies <laughs> found here in the book. Then verses 8 to 12, Tobias Astri argues a little bit with Raguel, finally obtains leave of Raguel, and along with Raphael, and along with his dog, by the way, <laughs> he's got his friendly neighborhood dog with him, he takes his wife, Sarah, back home to meet his parents which ends the second section of the book that deals with the journey itself. And so the trip is made back home. Then we said chapters 11 through 14 give us the post-journey event. In chapter 11, we've got the homecoming of Tobias, the opening of the blind eyes of Tobit, which verse 16b causes great joy. It's a great testimony for all the Jews that live in Nineveh. Then in chapter 12, we have their reckoning with Raphael. They're trying to pay him for his uh, duties as a guide for Tobias to be able to find media in the first place. And here they discover that Raphael's not an average man. Raphael's one of the angels of the Lord, which has been sent to bless all the parties involved. Chapter 13 is just a little short hymn of praise composed and sung by Tobit. Too bad it wasn't recorded. We'd know what type of voice he had. Then chapter 14, we have the conclusion to the story. The conclusion to the story with the deaths of all of the major parties involved. Verses 1 to 2, a summary of Tobit's life. Verses 3 through 11, Tobit's deathbed charge to Tobias. And it concerns the fall of Nineveh, as prophesied by Jonah and Nahum, which we've also just mentioned in the intertestamental period. Then the last four verses, verses 12 through 15, we have the move of Tobias in accord with his father's command to leave Nineveh before it falls. And we have the death of Tobias and evidently of his wife as well. Which brings an end to this story. They lived over a hundred years each. So they did live happily ever after. Before he died, he rejoiced the last part of the last verse in the book over the fate of Nineveh and praised the Lord God who lives forever and ever. Amen. Amen.